Um, I must say it's very humbling to address this illustrious crowd. You, you know more about Asia than I'm sure I do. <clears throat> but I hope, I, <clears throat> I hope that something new will come up that can be gleaned from this presentation. So thank you very, very much for, um, for being here. Um, the book, uh, The Wards in the Mountains, um, took me eight years and 72,000 miles of travel to research. And the thread throughout the book was to, to figure out why there is a link between mountains and violence. And it started out in Asia, and Asia figures very prominently. The book covers Latin America um, in this particular um, specifically Colombia and Mexico. It also covers the Balkans and the, and the, um, the North Caucasus, but a large, large uh, segment of the book is in Asia itself. And the way people oftentimes ask me, how did you come up with this idea? You know, what, what inspired you? And what inspired me was indirectly Asia. Uh, I presume here people are familiar with the board game Risk. Yep, the board, which is a game of world domination. And the men in my family like to play it. They're obsessed with it. And we were playing it one day, my husband, my son, and I. And it, I, we were going on and on for like five hours. We were trying to get control of Afghanistan, the way everybody has over the years. And after five hours, it looked like my son was going to lose Afghanistan. So he needed a diversionary tactic. So he said, Mom, Mom, he was only 11 at the time. So he goes, Mom, Mom, uh, get a globe, get a globe, and show me where there's conflict in the world right now. And where have you worked? Because I've covered quite a few conflicts. So I brought the globe over, and I'm spinning it, and I'm pointing out the places. And as I would point it out with my finger, he would put his finger there. And then he said, Mom, they're all in the mountains. Why? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, find out. <laughs> so that's how the book began, uh, in right. Afghanistan. <laughs> Um, so that's how it began. And as I traveled those 72,000 miles over eight years, I began to find answers to his question as to why mountains are midwives to sustain conflict. And some of the longest standing conflicts in the world are in mountains. And um, largely, if, if one had to sum up the thesis very, very succinctly and superficially, it's that the geographic isolation nurtures psychological isolation as well. So it creates an insularity of culture. From a tactical point of view, militarily, you cannot, you cannot, um, a conventional army has never, ever um, defended, has never de uh, defeated or conquered a defending mobile indigenous population. I mean, you just look at Afghanistan. Nobody's been able to get control of it. The closest that anybody came to it was Alexander the Great in what was then Bactria. And it wasn't a military conquering, per se. What it was is he married a warlord's daughter and then asked his fellow troops to do so, to also marry local women. So it was more co-option than actual defeat. So those are some factors that tactically you cannot get you cannot, and it's very hard for an invader to actually come in and hold that territory. And then you have locals who are very, very resistant to outsiders coming in. So you have those two factors. Um, so I am going to, OK, there's the book. Um, also, mountains create sanctuaries. So it's a place that people go to hide. Um, for instance, I, I presume people are aware of the book um, by James C. Scott, uh, the Art of Not Governing. Are people aware of it? He, he looks at Burma and other South Asian countries where people have gone up to the mountains to get away from society. And that's a classic thing that you see a lot in mountains, that they're places that people will go to to get away from authority. And they're places where people are very marginalized. It's oftentimes the poorest part of a country. They're usually minority groups. It's the last place where roads are built, where schools are built, where clinics are built. And people are, um, they're resentful. And, and, they're, and very, very rarely do you find the center of elite, either political or economic, in the highlands. It's usually at a lowland. Um, and then usually outsiders will only come in not to build roads and schools, but because they want something. Because they want uranium, or they want water, or they want gold. But they, so people feel, people in the mountains will feel very resentful because the outside world really only takes interest in them when they want something from them. So all those factors 
um, create, uh, can create a very explosive combination of, um, of um, factors. So when you look at it just from a numerical point of view, 10% of the world's population lives in mountains. Mountains cover 25% of the Earth's surface, but about 80% of persistent conflict happens in mountains. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic um, statistic. Um, so anyway, Asia here, which you're all familiar with. And these are just some of the places where we've seen conflict recently. Burma and Kachin, Vietnam during the 60s. You know, the, the, the United States could not have any, uh, the mountains abetted the locals, the Viet Cong, and it was very, very hard for the US. Look in the Korean War too, uh, back, back way back in the 50s, again, the mountains created huge, huge um, problems for the United States when they intervened. You have the Maoist insurgency that lasted for quite a few years. Afghanistan, nobody's been able to tame Afghanistan. Kashmir been, has been going on basically since the 40s. And then you have the various other stands. I mean, Pakistan is a hotbed of different groups and whatnot. So this is just a very, very small list of you know, what, we, what we see in Asia. Um, so these are the factors that I went through before. Now, each chapter in my book looks at a different element of conflict that occurs in mountains. And a very big thing is resources. Um, if, as I mentioned before, if you have a very marginalized minority community in a mountain and suddenly the state intervenes and wants to take, or, or a corporation intervenes and wants to take control of their resources, you're obviously going to get some conflicts. And we're seeing that um, unfolding right now in the Himalayas. This is a map, a very, very small partial map of, um, of the um, hydroelectric dams which are being planned in the five Himalayan countries. Uh, there's about, it, for the five countries, there's about 500 dams in nearly all of the 32 major valleys that are either being built at the moment or being planned. And the thing about water is it always rises in the mountains. So if you want to build a high dam, it's going to affect your mountain population. And the Himalayas provide half of the world's population with water, and it's, it's a giant water tank of 3,000 cubic miles. So it's, it's a piece of real estate which has suddenly become very, very important. And there's a very senior World Bank official who had said a couple of years ago, well, he had forecast that the wars of the 21st century would be fought over water, not over oil. And I think we're going to, this is where it's going to happen, if it happens anywhere. Um, so what I did is to center this particular chapter, I went to the Septicosa River in, Himala in the Himalayas, which is fed by five tribu uh, seven tributaries, one of which comes off down off of Everest. And India and Nepal have come to an agreement to build a giant high dam that would basically flood all the surrounding area. And the people that live in this area, are, are it's a minority group. Um, they make up only 2.8% of the Nepali population. They're the Rai people. They, um, they have been very, um, they've always been one of the, the ethnic groups that joined the Gurkhas. And again, you know, here we're talking about hardy people who make good fighters. You've got your Gurkhas. Um, and these folks are really, really upset because unlike most Nepalis, they bury their dead in the land and they will be displaced. The, the Indian term for people who are displaced by dams are ousties. These people will lose their lands, they'll lose their villages, and they'll be, and they'll be paid very little um, compensation for this. And they're very, very resentful. So when I went up to this area, this is in the eastern Terai, the easternmost corner of the country. Um, they were really resentful because the hydroelectric dam is not only going to rob them of their lands, but it's not going to bring them any electricity, which they don't have now. It's not going to help them water their fields. The electricity would largely benefit India to the financial gain of the elites in Kathmandu. So these folks were saying uh, they had been involved in the, in the Nepali um, insurgency, the, the Maoist insurgency before. These villages were very involved, and they were saying, we're going to pick up arms again. We're going to fight. So they've been having very, very noisy protests. But the potential for it to explode into a conflict is, um, is quite large. And what they've been doing, their leader is an 82-year-old man who's extraordinarily physically fit. 
And he walks sometimes five hours a day between villages to try to get this network of isolated villages to unite into a movement. And the, they're, they're going to fight. They're going to fight if this dam is built, which it probably will be. And so to me, um, that exemplified one of the biggest problems that we're going to be seeing in that particular region in the years to come. So water resources. Then we move to another place in the Himalayas, which is Kashmir. And Kashmir has sort of every factor that you can imagine for a conflict. Uh, one of them being that it's, it's in a, what's called, it's called a buffer zone, but it, it's not a buffer for the people that live there. And oftentimes mountains form, like rivers form national boundaries. And they're artificially drawn because people are living in these boundaries and they don't want to be caught between the two. And as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, you have both uh, Pakistan and India competing for the small piece of real estate in Kashmir. And the, uh, some other factors that we see in Kashmir that we see in a lot of other mountain um, insurgencies, it's, it's an ethnic mi minority that wants um, its own independent homeland, and it's not getting it. Then you have these two, these two foreign powers, basically, that are fighting over it. Um, and it's, been, it, it's a place that has very little resources. The government, the Indian government, has not put a lot of money into developing Kashmir, which I'll get to in a, in a, in a minute. And Nepal has a saying, you know, because Nepal is caught between India and China, and they have an, ex an expression, a yam caught between two boulders. Well, Kashmir is like, it's not just caught, the yam has been absolutely smashed. And that's had a devastating effect on the, on the populace. Um, Okay, well, I'll, I'll move ahead to that, which is when you go to um, one of the things that really struck me about Kashmir is it has one of the highest levels of post-traumatic stress from a complex zone anywhere in the world. And it's because the populace has no... One of the things that causes post-traumatic stress is not only endemic violence, but a sense of unpredictability and randomness and being caught having no control over your life. They have no control over the political system. They have no control over stopping the violence. And the number of armed actors is enormous. You have 14 armed groups that are ranging from just garden variety separatists to jihadists who are al-Qaeda linked. Then you have India and Pakistan fighting over the area. And um, most common ordinary civilians are just caught in between. The, the number of disappearances has been immense, um, largely at the hands of the Indian authorities. About 10,000 young men have disappeared in 20 years. And remember what I was saying about the lack of resources? These pictures were taken in um, the, Seoul, the Seoul Psychiatric Hospital in Srinagar, the, um, the capital. And the one psychiatrist who works there sees between 60,000 and 100,000 patients a year. And so this is a typical waiting room for him. I mean, the government, the Indian government, again, typical, you know, lowland elite do not put resources into a mountain area. Um, they don't care about Kashmir and the mental health of Kashmir. This is, this is a typical um, consulting room. Uh, you might find 35 people there at a time. And this one psychiatrist is seeing them. He works six days a week, sometimes seven. And he basically has time to write a prescri prescription for somebody, hand over a box of pills to somebody else. And then everybody's bringing in their families also because they're coming in from the villages high up in the mountains. And it's just crowded with people, really distressed people. And they usually get one shot at seeing him, and then that's it. And sometimes they travel hundreds of miles to see him. They can't keep doing that because they don't have the resources. It's a, it's a devastating human, um, human toll. Um, it really is a, it's a society in, in, in psychological collapse. Um, then there's something else. So what a lot of people are doing, therefore, is they're turning to faith healers, um, traditional faith healers. Uh, this man, all right, he, he's a little bit eccentric. He's, he sits naked under a blanket, and people give him objects to be blessed. Uh, usually things that you can swallow, like a bottle of water or some sugar. And then they say they feel better afterwards. Um, this other, this is a, they, they call the faith healers peers. This peer holds office hours the way a doctor would. So every Thursday morning and every Tuesday morning, he has a little shingle hanging outside his, 
his office. People will come in, and the way he treats um, psychological distress is to run beads over somebody's face and incant um, phrases from the Quran. And people say they feel better. And you know they'll make an appointment and come back in two weeks. And so it's easier for them to get help than these folks. But that's really what it's come down to. The, just the whole medical system is not equipped to deal with the, the crisis there. Then um, Kashmir is also very extreme in another way, <coughs> which is it's the world's highest battlefield at 18,000 feet. Most people, I presume there are some mountain mountaineers here. I mean, 18,000 feet is incredibly difficult for a human body to, to operate at. You basically, the body's fluids will flood your lungs and your brain. And um, more people have died in the stalemate on this glacier um, from exposure, from uh, pulmonary or cerebral edema or frost or from... Um, from avalanches than they have from actual bullets. And it's just, it's insane. You've, Pakistan and India are at this stalemate, at this ridiculous, ridiculous height. And the thing is, you know, it's too high for a helicopter to land. Obviously, a plane can't land there. And um, there's a form of madness that's been um, identified that basically for men that spend more than um, three months up there come down with horrific psychological effects of having been starved of oxygen and being in this, this pointless stalemate on top of this glacier. The only way to get the supplies up oftentimes is by ropes and porters. And the thing is, because you can't move the troops in and out via, via aircraft, it's not financially viable to have to have people come out for short periods of time. So they can be there for anywhere from three months to six months, which is <coughs> very, very damaging to the body, if not the mind. But it's, 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 it just shows the absurdity of war. Um, there's a lot of absurd things about the situation in Kashmir. It's, it's intractable. There doesn't seem to be a solution in sight. And to wage it on top of a, a glacier is just, it's, it's just unfathomable to me. It, it, there's really no point to it. Um, so that's another uh, part of Asia that's in the book. Um, obviously, you can't talk about um, conflict in Asia without Afghanistan. This is Osama bin Laden in Tora Bora. And I'm sure as everybody here knows in this room, Afghanistan is... Nobody's been able to, to conquer it or tame it. You have isolated, here again, the geography plays a really big role. You've got isolated villages and valleys where on one side of the mountain they speak one language, on the other side of the mountain they speak another one. It's really, really hard to get a centralized government, and yet people try and keep trying and keep trying. And this just gives you an example of, you know, the US, mighty U.S. military went after bin Laden and Tora Bora, and they just couldn't get him. Um, the terrain worked to the advantage of the mountain defenders and the, the people hiding there. Um, they use caves a lot. Um, I mean, this is fairly typical of some of the terrain where people are fighting. This is in the Hindu Kush in the Shahikat Valley. And my chapter <coughs> that deals with Afghanistan deals with the futility of some of the tactics of the U.S. military when they fought their first major battle in Afghanistan which was uh, named Operation Anaconda. This was in 2002. And the thing about the US military, it's the world's largest expeditionary force, but um, we don't have a dedicated mountain unit. Uh, every other major NATO country does, and India does, and China does, and Russia does, and Colombia does, but the United States doesn't. And the philosophy of the US military is that if you can fight in a city, you can fight in a desert, you should be an all-rounder. But it, that becomes a real problem when you go to a place like Afghanistan. So we have something called the 10th Mountain Division, which was trained for the mountains back in World War II. And they fought very, very well in, in World War II because they had trained in the, in the Rockies. Um, the 10th Mountain Division no longer trains in the mountains. <coughs> 
They're, they train in something called Fort Drum, which is in New York State, which is, which is a flat, sea-level, swampy area. But they hold on to the legacy of the name. So in the eternal wisdom of the world's largest expeditionary force, they sent the 10th Mountain Division to Afghanistan. Now, as any country that has a military unit knows, you have to train with altitude. You go up, and then you go down, and you go up, and you go down. And normally, it's um, <laughs> most countries do it. You know, will train a unit maybe over three to six months. Spain does it for seven months. These guys hadn't had this training, so they went from 5,000 feet to this area, which is 10,500 feet. They get off the plane, the helicopters, and they can't breathe. So they collapse like beach whales on the rock right here. This is the guys coming out of the helicopters, and they, they couldn't fight. They could barely walk. So what they did is they threw the rucksacks, which weighed about 80 to 100 pounds. They just threw them because they couldn't walk with them. And they start climbing up the rock face without their sleeping bags, without their water, without their food. I mean, it was insane. And they came under very heavy fire, and they weren't battle fit. And t this just exemplifies what fighting. This is like the worst case scenario of fighting in a mountain, of an invading force coming in and not really understanding what they were facing. And then, as you know, in mountains, there are huge fluctuations in temperature. So in the Shahikat, it can go from 70 degrees during the day to snowing at night. So these guys, because they'd thrown the rucksacks behind, they didn't have their sleeping bags and whatnot. So, and, there, and in those days, the US Army didn't equip people properly for the mountains. And um, they didn't have, now they, now they finally have the proper gear, like, which, which was modeled on civilian mountaineering gear. But in those days, they didn't. So these guys are wearing t-shirts, and they're sweating. Now, cotton doesn't wick moisture. Any mountaineer knows you need fabrics that are going to wick moisture. They didn't have that. So their t-shirts are soaking. And then the, the temperature plummets at night, snow starts dusting them, they have nothing to cover themselves, and they're freezing. So they grew very, very sick. And then, you know, the problem with mountains is that you have to be resupplied by helicopters if you're not a local force. So the helicopters couldn't come in because there was a lot of enemy fire and a lot of cloud cover, so the guys couldn't get uh, fresh supplies of water or food. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. It was like the worst mountain fighting experience you can imagine. Mighty. American Army. Um, so that's what the chapter on Afghanistan looks at, at just you know, a worst case scenario of how difficult it is to wage war in the mountains if you're an outsider coming in. And you know, the locals there and the, the people who were helping bin Laden, you know, they didn't have all this heavy gear, but they knew where to get food. They knew the trails. They knew where the caves were. It was really, really easy for them to just scuttle about. And um, there's a quote that I have that actually we, we ha um, I, are people aware of who this gentleman is, Gen General Sir Andrew Skeen? No. Okay, he, he was a British general, and he wrote a book about fighting in the, um, the territory, the, the area, the Pashtun area between um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and his book was published in 1932. And he had a quote about the, the Pashtun tribesmen. And it hasn't changed that much from today, from then. And this is what a typical mountain indigenous fighter would be. You know, they're, they're, they, they come down hillsides like falling boulders, not running but bounding. And in crags, they literally drop from foothold to foothold. Now, these Americans here, uh, oops. Hold on. The Americans here can't do that. You know, they have all this gear on their back. They don't know where the footholds are. They don't know where the caves are. And um, it's just extraordinary how things don't change there. And the people fighting there, coming from the outside, don't seem to realize that. So um, anyway, that's Afghanistan. And what the American army found over its very, very long war there is that they increasingly began to use mules. Because mules, you know, you can't really use a motorized vehicle there because it announces your presence. But, and a mule is very sure-footed, and it, the sound of a mule blends in with the local sounds, and they're used locally. So you're much better off having a mule than, um, you know, a more modern mechanized form of transport in these areas. And ropes. The U.S. also began to... Um, <coughs> 
I don't know if there are any ropes in that picture. They also started to use more ropes as the war went on. Um, at the very beginning, they didn't use any ropes. And most mountain units rely on ropes, as we saw with the Kashmir picture. Um, the other thing that they began to change is, I don't know if you can see here, their boots. They had these boots that were not um, well suited to walking on rocks. So after a month, they would fully shred. So now, finally, the US Army has issued other boots for mountain fighting. But they, again, the way they approached this was not very wise. Um, now, can I talk about the North Caucasus? I know it's, it's not technically Asia, but it's the bridge between Asia and Europe. And there were characteristics that I found in Dagestan and Chechnya that do exist in, um, in Afghanistan, which is a predominance of, um, a preponderance of warlords. And the thing about Dagestan, for instance, there's 62 ethnic groups. And in, um, in, well, 62 clans, and there are 150 kinship groups in Chechnya, and that really complicates the insurgency, uh, the religious insurgency against the Russian authorities. Because you not only have fighting against Russia, you also have fighting for turf among different clans and different warlords. And it, they will come up, some of them will be allied with the Russians and, because they don't like other clans that aren't. So it, it, it really adds another complexity to this, which is even more complicated than Kashmir, where you simply have people. Well, even Kashmir is complicated because you have some people side with Pakistan, some people side with India. Then you have these 14 other groups that don't side with either. Here, you, you have all these different ethnic groups that are oftentimes at war with each other. And the terrain really, really plays a very big fit here. This is, this is one village I went to. <coughs> the women are wearing black because all the men in their family has been killed, including these two young men. And the clan fighting, it's, it's a place called Kirovaul. And the clan fighting has dominated much of the violence in this particular area, where people will align themselves with one side or the other, largely due to ancient feuding between the various clans. Um, and the terrain really, really um, helps the insurgents. When you, when you look at Chechnya, um, the Russians bombed Grozny, the main city which lies in the plains. They had, they had quite a lot of military success in the city and on the plains. But, but then what happened is the fighters simply went up in the mountains. And the Russians did not have any major military um, successes in the mountain areas because the terrain is just so rough. And what happened was once the Russians had pacified, to a certain degree, Chechnya, the fighters then went and moved to Dagestan which has a much more inaccessible geography and, which, and so many hiding places and where there's even less cohesion. And um, so the, they simply went from one place to an even more complicated geography, and that made it very, very difficult for the Russians. And um, you know now the, the jihadists will come down, and they might blow up a train station in Moscow, or they'll stage an attack in St. Petersburg, but the mountains are where they're hiding and that's where their sanctuaries are, and that's where they organize. And again, you know, you have these clans, they're very, very tightly knit, and these folks tend to be very well embedded in the local population, and there's a sense of insularity in these clans, and it aids this sort of guerrilla activity, because with that insular mentality and co social cohesion within a very, very small group, nobody's gonna betray you to the authorities. Um, so, um, so you were looking at your watch. I think we're, I'm kind of nearing the end um, of the time allotted, but if anybody has any questions I would, or insights, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Mark Bailey at King's College. Um, Underlying everything you say is part of uh, a huge amount of other contexts, you know, the movement of Burma, uh, the Golden Triangle, and, uh, and um, Afghanistan in, in detail, but lots of other conflicts are the uh, conflict between uh, nations as opposed to states, you mentioned Kurds, and that this is an increasing uh, problem where the artificial, the, 
huge number of artificial states, mainly post-British Empire, post-Soviet Empire, just do not fit with the people who live there. Right. And the, the people who live there know who they are. It doesn't matter. Right. If Kurds know their Kurds, the Poles know their Poles. Yeah. Um, and, and this is an increasing problem everywhere, but perhaps more sharply in mountains because they're often frontiers. Yeah, yeah, like, like with um, Kashmir being a frontier, yeah. Because they're frontiers and also, um, yeah, you have small pockets of people who are just caught in these communities and um, it doesn't fit into the, the notion of the nation state. Yeah. David. Don't you think that, uh, in fact, um, political states, we talk of states rather than nations, uh, their governments, often place far too much political importance on control of the mountains than any practical reason? I'm thinking just of the one or two I have some vague experience of. I'm mean, taking an example the uh, uh, Royalist Egyptian Republican War in North Yemen in the mid 60s. Um, there you had a classic case the mountains were controlled by the Royalists and the rest of the country by the Republicans with the Egyptian army uh, to do the job for them. The Republicans, in fact, controlled everything that was worth having they had the ports, the cities, the villages the roads, the water, everything. Up in the mountains, the royalists had to rely on airdrops for weapons and overland fuel supplies and food supplies from Saudi Arabia and Saudi to keep going, which the Egyptians then were fighting the British and whatever uh, underhand way, uh, you know, unofficially, to cut off those supplies. But they never made a move into the mountains. They didn't need to. The mountains were, in fact, irrelevant. He ran the country without them. Burma's had uh, a sort of mountain insurgency for 70 years. It's actually it been irrelevant to Burma as a country. It's something that happens up in the hills. Um, it only becomes important when politicians think make it important. Mm. In fact, the best way most countries deal with problems in the mountains is simply to ignore it. Mm. They have nothing. They have no airfields. They have no ports. They have no food. They're just cut off. I mean, OK, they've, they've got a few Kalashnikovs and some ammunition which they've smuggled in. But that's no use. So I think you're actually possibly overstating the importance of mountains. They're only important because people say they are. Hmm. OK. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm open to being convinced. <laughs> I think, but, you know, with Burma, for instance, the jade trade happens in Kachin. I mean, it's, it's very, very important economically at the moment. It's not unimportant. It's a hugely lucrative market that's largely illicit. In, um, in Colombia, I mean, we're getting outside Asia here, if that's okay. But you look at Colombia where a peace deal has supposedly been signed after 50 years of war by the FARC. Um, those mountains are really, really important because you have a multi-billion dollar cocaine smuggling industry. It comes from the mountains. It's hugely important. Hugely much, important. They too, they're much more accessible. You get to they're not accessible at all. They're not. Mountain, We're talking about 15,000 feet high. That's I, not I, accessible with no roads. I, I no would roads. agree with... Um, with a lot of what David says, uh, except, of course, uh, you, uh, you were uh, pointing out the importance of water and, yeah. and water coming from the, from the mountains and this thing. If you look at your slide of the Himalayas and this sort of thing, it's, uh, um, uh, that, I think, is going to be uh, uh, quite a flashpoint. Um, we all know who's going to build the dam, and the dam will be built. Yes. Any more? Yes, please. Uh, yes, I, I, I wonder if you emphasize enough the deep cultural difference between mountain and lowland people because of different agricultural practices. I mean, if, you, if you're running an arable, large arable agriculture, uh, you put a very strong premium indeed on a feasible surroundings in which you can sow and nurture and harvest your crops. And as we find in this country, the Anglo-Saxons set up a very orderly civic society. Whereas if you go out to Scotland, uh, the crop season in the mountains is short, 
Um, it's uh, people live far more on livestock. Livestock. Uh, raiding is extremely profitable. This has been so for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, it's not only profitable, it's exciting. Um, and it's not going to affect your basic agriculture. Uh, so there's a very deep uh, culture of fighting is seen as something acceptable and good in mountains that is not nearly as strong. I mean, we're all mm. fighting creatures uh, rival, uh, in, in, in lowland areas. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if people are more um, predestined to fighting, if they're more not aggressive. Predestined, yeah. but, um, it's, if it, it's, it's a cultural development uh, yeah. from their surroundings. Well, what you do find universally from range to range, continent to continent, is, as he said, it's livestock-oriented. And they tend to be very, very conservative, patriarchal societies. And oftentimes, you know, the family and the honor, the honor feud, are very, very powerful. You find that in Afghanistan. You find it in the Balkans. You find it even in Greece to some extent. But you can afford you know. to have feuds of that nature. You mm. can't afford to have them in lowland arable. Yeah, if you have more populated areas, you need a modern system of, of policing and courts and whatnot. What, what emerged during the era of the city-states that we have today, largely. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a very, very small, largely homogeneous population of 200 people, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine the, uh, a modern system working as well. Yeah, I'm thinking so, that. You know, yeah. it have to be a modern system. Yeah. So, uh, well, I am open to yeah, but but what you but you know you do also have a really strong point because when you look at um, pasture lands, and again this is universal from the Andes to the Alps, they're communal yeah. because there's so little arable land, and the communities have to be ta tight knit for survival of both themselves and their livestock, and that's a trait that you see across the world. Yeah, but that's lowland pasture. No, no, this is highland. These are high pastures. Yeah, like if you go up to the Pyrenees, it's. Um, which is highland. Yeah. It's, it's communal. Mm. Likewise in the, in the Alps yeah. and likewise in the Andes. Yeah, we're talking about really high. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'm thinking now of the, the other example of a geographical boundary, which of course is the big river. Rivers. And I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on whether there's any comparison between yeah. them. I, I, accepting that mountains generally are hundreds of kilometers. Right. Apart. But you still get the same barrier of right. cultural differences across right. the bigger rivers. But a river is like a highway. You can use it to travel. The thing about a mountain, it's a fortress. A mountain is a natural barrier. And people, there's not as much tra transiting of people and goods back and forth. A river is a highway, and it was, that's why we have big cities, you know, going, stretching all the way, you know, thousands of years back, built by rivers because you can get goods and movement of people back and forth. So they tend to yield more, more um, heterogeneous uh, cultures than, than an insular, inbred one. And I accept that a river longitudinally yeah. is, is a yeah. highway, but culturally, they are, they are often barriers. I mean, yeah. it's even a, 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 a very, very small, almost sort of yeah. you know, regional level. You know. Yeah. I think less than mountains, though, I think. Yorkshiremen are very, very different from Lincolnshire people. <laughs> 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 Sophie. I was going to say that the lowland versus highland thing, I looked at quite a while in Central Asia, and people always would say to us, that it's not that Right. You can run off. Whereas if you are a mountain nomad, you have to stay and fight because if somebody takes your little patch of <coughs> meadow where you can graze your flocks and you get driven off it, the chances are you starve. Right. Um, and therefore, there is more of a cultural reason to stay right. and fight because it is a, a survival issue. Yeah. Um, you can't just move Yeah. I mean, just to riff on that a little bit, there's, there is an organization called the World Mountain People Association. You don't have the World Swamp People Association. You don't have the World Desert People Association. But you have a group which brings together mountain people from 70 different countries around the world. And they say 
that they have certain personality characteristics and a certain outlook towards life that is different from people of the plains, which you know supports what a lot of you've been saying. Phil, could you also say that um, um, another factor of uh, uh, conflict in the mountains, which is in point of life, is very difficult to, uh, as a general rule, to, to reach uh, a decisive conclusion to, for all the reasons that you've given. But this has the result that, uh, that, that some disputed mountain areas, uh, the disputes continue for literally centuries. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, the Sino-Indian uh, business. Uh, I mean, there have been Chinese claims in the Himalayas literally hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, Chinese invasions into the Himalayas uh, long, a very long time before 1962. 1962 is already quite a long time ago from now, and there's absolutely no sign of, of, of this. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, it just goes on and on and on. And when you look at the, some of the longest guerrilla wars since um, World War II, Colombia, 50 years, Eta. Well, Eta isn't fully a mountain war, but it had, there's a mountain mentality there. Uh, 50 years, uh, Kashmir, we've been going on now since 19... The late 1940s. I mean, these are these are very, very persistent um, conflicts, and unresolvable. So it seems. Okay, last question. I want to go back to David's comments because I want to take issue with the fact that I thought one of the problems with ignoring the mountains is, in fact, they are the nest of vipers. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for instance, my president, Donald Trump, he's going on and on about building a wall on the border, although it looks like that's not going to happen now. But he really should be worried about the mountains, because that's where all the narcos have their operations. It's in the Sierra Madre, it's the Sierra Nevada, it's in the Andes. All, and look at, also look at Burma, look at Afghanistan. Where are drugs that, are, that my government, at least, are worried about? Where do they come from? They come from the mountains. And when you look at... Um, when ISIS comes under pressure, they head to the hills. Al-Qaeda has used the hills for years and years. Um, it's, they are where people go. Boko Haram in Nigeria, they're heading further up in altitude now as they come under military pressure. It's where people go. The Kurds, they've been going on for ages in the mountains. Hence the big buster bomb that was, was uh, uh, set, on, set in Afghanistan was last week. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be very effective. <laughs> okay, well, um, as I said, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank, thank Judith you. for the, uh, the talk. And uh, as I say, if anybody wants them, there's copies of the book here uh, are for sale. I'm sure Judith will sign them as well. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.